life and lit up and wow you know we were all smiling from from ear to ear that's fan- fantastic and uh, and jeff i'll ask you the same in a sec but i have to say um david miller says good morning from seattle let's just put david up there thank you very much david and uh, and i see that um stuart johnston have you heard of him um jeff stuart johnston is also <laughs> watching <laughs> Jeff, you were on board the J99 for this race. What was it like for you? It was really fun. It's a, the Round the Island race is an 18 mile uh, race around uh, Connecticut Island, and uh, this is an annual event um, which kicks off the New York Yacht Club's annual regatta. So this is a rite of passage for uh, for all of us in the area uh, every June, and this is the first opportunity to uh, sail the boat against some competition. And uh, it was the uh, first time uh, uh, Hannah and Brian came over from the UK, so were joining us. And uh, I had uh, some of my close friends on board. And so it was the first race of the year. And uh, it was a great test. We, uh, we started it in flat water um, inside the uh, bay. And uh, the breeze was building as we got out to the first turning mark, which is uh, sort of behind us in the picture, where you can see some other boats. And uh, as we got out to the mark, uh, you know, the sea state increased. Uh, I came around the mark, and it was mostly a run, broad reach run, uh, with a following swell. And then, as you'll see, I think we've got a video sequence uh, uh, a little later. Well, actually, uh, yeah, the, and then, the, uh, then it flattened out again uh, with breeze, and then it died at the uh, north end. It was a little bit of everything, uh, which is uh, the nature of that race. So it's a great all-around test uh, yeah. right out of the box. Yeah, and, and as you alluded to, we have uh, a little video clip of the action there. There is no uh, commentary with this, guys. So if you want to talk over the top of it, that's that's great. And thanks very much for uh, putting this together, uh, Stu Johnson. Let's play uh, this video. It's only about 30 seconds or so. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, Louis, that uh, this is probably... Uh maybe about a third of the way uh, down the backside, uh, still getting, uh, you'll notice, still getting some swell action. And uh, this is a little bit more of a, we were right on the edge of, we wanted to, uh, rum line was a little low of this course, and so we were really just uh, trying to go on a lazy plane. Um, we didn't want to sail up off the rum line too much, so we're trying to take any sort of puffs and and uh, waves and ride it down uh, while planing. You see the boat's just just move it along. We get the Vang East a little bit. Uh, that's a normal A2 runner, not oversized for the boat. And, uh, you know, just uh, balanced really well, accelerated well. And and it was really nice to be in front of a huge pack of boats. Yeah. And and, and as you're saying, playing that particular angle, I, I'm guessing your VMG was pretty good if you were if you were soaking down on those puffs. Uh, uh, you, you were VMG running there. Would that be a fair one, Jeff? Yeah, I would say so. And of course, uh, there were a, a mix of boats behind us, a lot of A-sails, a lot of light displacement boats and a lot of bigger boats. And uh, and certainly uh, as the breeze veered, uh, it headed as we uh, as we kept going forward, actually built and headed uh, the boats with the A-sails uh, had a huge advantage uh, coming into the midway point around the island. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have video of that, but there are a lot of wipeouts. Uh, we were... <laughs> we were we were one boat that didn't wipe out, so that was uh, that was fun to have happen. Okay, well let's uh, let's move on. Let's have a look at uh, the next slide, um, and uh, this one is taken in the Solon, and this is the J99 Jet at the Lansell Tires J Cup last year. Jeff on the helm. Uh, Hannah, you weren't on board the, the this boat at this time, but just tell us why you think the J99 is ideal for solent racing well, the j99 is just that really nice just just sub 10 meter size um fits really nicely in in marinas um and and it takes a, a nice solent shop really well um at j cup I'm, I'm sure some more of the uh the people that caught the dialed in today have, were, were there with us and it was a really breezy event um all the best that the solent had to throw at us and it just it really does just come to light in those, you know, um, those kind of medium conditions, kind of 15 knots. You know, it, it, it just it just stands out as a great all rounder. Yeah. And, and Jeff, um, I know you hadn't been to the J Cup for a few years. You were, you were coming back to it. What 
I, th I think I, I, I think I've got that right. Maybe you haven't. But uh, what's the J Cup like, Jeff? Just to maybe tell the friends watching from the states what the J Cup's like. It it is a uh, an incredible reunion of of uh, old friends, new friends. Uh, it's uh, it's all about the sailing um, for five hours out of the day, and then the uh, the other nineteen. It's all about uh, hanging with your friends and having a great time and. Uh, it uh, this year was a little bittersweet, uh, very bittersweet. Uh, we were honoring uh, uh, Paul Hayes, who who uh, tragically passed away um, the, the prior winter a year ago, and uh, he um, he was a huge ins inspiration for the for the uh, all the J fleets there. Uh, in fact, the J ninety nine was uh, the idea for the boat was born from from uh, actually a conversation with Paul a couple of years ago, and. Uh, so he, he's uh, definitely part of the uh, uh, original inspiration for this design. But uh, the event itself was amazing, um, a huge turnout, and uh, and the breeze, Mother Nature cooperated. We had great breeze. This is actually the lightest part of the day there. Um, we had actually, uh, it was 30 plus uh, that whole, whole last run uh, down to the finish, and uh, I think we had uh, pulled off four jibes, hit a top speed of 18 and a half knots, and we had a great crew on the, on board, but uh, none of us had ever sailed together before. So it was uh, everyone good sailor, but we had to pull together immediately and, and figure out the boat. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Okay, okay. And, you know, you talked about um, the concept of the J99, and that's why we're pulling up this next slide. Um, what, what was the overall concept for the design of this boat, Jeff? Well, it, it really uh, it germinated uh, uh, in, in several ways. Uh, we had seen a, a great response to the one two one and this concept of sailing with your friends, less crew, uh, offshore signature races. Uh, and uh, we'd seen uh, that uh, aspect of sailing growing when a lot of uh, competitive sailing was uh, actually uh, ebbing on the last uh, last several years other than one design. So it was either one design around the buoys uh, or if it was offshore, it was uh, Rolex Fastnet, uh, Caribbean 600, the um, uh, Chicago Mac, Bermuda Race, Transpac, all these events are thriving. And, uh, and people are making plans years in advance to do these events. And, and we felt that uh, there's a real need for something right in the size range. It's perfect size, uh, big enough where you can sail Cat A uh, and qualify for Cat A under ISO and, and CE and do these uh, big events, but small enough uh, that's manageable uh, without powered winches and all the other big systems you need on a bigger boat. So uh, really a compact, offshore, capable uh, performance boat that can plane that at the end of the day can still pass the family sailing test. Okay. Thank you for you know that 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 broad uh, broad description of the of the concept, and um, here we have the cockpit of the J ninety nine and and Hannah, I, I, you know, uh, uh, Jeff alluded to the dual purpose of the type of sailing that this boat does. Fully crewed, Hannah. What's your take on the cockpit setup for for the J ninety nine as as a fully crewed boat? It's it's ideally set up because there's plenty of space to move. Um, you can really get to, to all the winches, all the, you know, the, the helm isn't shoved in the corner and, you know, you've got space. If you want to have a tactician on board, then you, you really can sail that boat very, very comfortably with with six or even even seven if you wanted to. Whilst, you know, having everything within reach from the helm station, you've got great controls on the backstay, on the main sheet. Um, you know, shorthanded is completely doable in this boat without you know without any modifications or any changes the boat comes very very comprehensively set up um in haulers already in place it's it really is a, a boat that you can splash in the water and and get sailing on Thank, thanks hannah and and keeping with this slide jeff um you know this this boat has been designed the j99 has been designed also with short-handed two-handed sailing in mind how does this cockpit setup reflect that well, it's, uh, uh, I, I'd like to compare um, my most recent experience uh, last 
years of, uh, of sailing and racing. Um, I owned a J88 for uh, uh, two seasons and uh, really enjoyed sailing on that. Um, crewed with friends on uh, J111 at the Worlds last year in Chicago and prior to that, the North Americans. And what I love about the 88 and boats in the size range, like the 92, 92S, is you can take that spin lock tiller extension, even without an autopilot, you can uh, extend it out all the way step forward in the cockpit and adjust the outhaul, the Cunningham, the Vang, put some halyard tension on. Um, just just the beauty of that size boat, small enough where uh, even without uh, an autopilot, you can by yourself uh, pretty much reach everything. And uh, what I love about the 111, uh, and this, this boat really is a mid-range between the 88 and the 111, is the fact that uh, when it's pouring rain and you're coming back in from the race course, uh, the whole crew can be comfortably down below uh, relaxing while while you or someone you can convince <laughs> is driving the boat. But uh, uh, from a shorthanded standpoint, as I said, everything's within reach. So you can set up the jib uh, uh, for cross sheeting uh, to the high side. So while you're sitting, uh, let's say you're sitting up to starboard here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, at either after the traveler or straddling the traveler, you could um, easily handle the fine tune on the main sheet, which gives you uh, uh, a lot of control without much load, mm -hmm. and you could be, uh, you know, easing and trimming the jib from the high side, like you like you can with a J80. In fact, okay, um, I'm going to pull this one in. This is from uh, Mauro uh, Grandone. I think he's probably uh, uh, calling in from Italy. Um, interesting comment, and I think um, I, I know I'm throwing this one without any preparation whatsoever, but. Uh, I, I, I think I'll put Jeff on the spot for this one. Two different uh, the Keel, uh, Keel, that's, that, that's a great question. I would say that, um, you know, in the absence of rating rules and the absence of handicap racing, um, the, the ideal keel for the boat is the standard keel, which is um, an L-shaped uh, fin with an with a integral bulb. Um, uh, we would call a wedge ball, but still has aerodynamic shape. Um, and uh, that is uh, the best bang for the buck. It's six and a half foot draft. It uh, gives you the most stability. Um, the under, under the handicap rules, if you're doing uh, specifically IRC historically over the last uh, uh, dozen years or even less, six to 10 years, um, generally uh, the rule is favored going without a bulb um, and going with a flat keel uh, tends to be deeper. And so uh, the problem is uh, rating rules change. And in fact, IRC was just tweaked uh, to uh, give a little less of a credit for that uh, style of keel. So if you're going to do shorthanded sailing, stability is the name of the game, and you don't want to give up stability. Um, it's fine if you're windward lured and you can feather the boat into the wind if you have a boat that's a little more tender. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you crack off a few degrees, as soon as you stick stick the boat on any kind of reach, then stability is your friend. And uh, so I think for most people sailing, the standard keel will be fine. If you're trying to win a particular um, handicap event that's primarily windward lured on close courses, then then the uh, flat keel is probably the uh, or that would be uh, poss possibly the option. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. I hope that. Uh answers your question, uh, Mauro. Um, and uh, we, the next slide is literally hot off the press. And um, I'm going to put Hannah, <laughs> I'm going to put Hannah on the spot here first off. Hannah, we had a little chat, we saw this photo. That is Rod Johnson. He's in his 80s. He's yeah. in pretty good shape, isn't he, Hannah? He's, he's brilliant. Um, I actually had the pleasure when, when I was over for the, the New York regatta last year, Rod was on board. Um, and this is actually him uh, commissioning his brand new J99, which is number 40, which has just arrived into the States. And I think Jeff has been very busy for the last two days um, commissioning this one and, and another. So despite the, the slightly cold Newport weather at the moment, he's, he's been keeping, keeping busy. Yeah. And, and, and Jeff, um, what has Rod called the boat? Uh, the name of the boat is Jazz, and um, if you might recall, the uh, uh, boat a boat built in the garage many, many years ago was called uh, Ragtime, yeah. and um, 
and all of Rod's boats are, are uh, have a musical name. Um, and uh, so uh, Jazz is the name. And uh, he uh, he and uh, my cousin Clay were were entered to be in the uh, Bermuda race this year, double handed. Uh -huh. um, and it, it, I'm not sure if it would have been a record, but um, and I won't say how old either of them are, but the combined <laughs> age and <clears throat> the combined age would have been 144 years oh my uh, oh between the. Uh, Double-handed crew, and and um, that was another reason to uh, to come out with a boat, or at least have a boat available for he and Clay, was that uh, uh, we couldn't line up a one-two-one -one for them the last Bermuda race, and um, so they made sure to order a boat for themselves this time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm going to bring another question in here from Alistair Ray. Obviously, Rod is looking to 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 take Jazz offshore. Um, where does the life raft go? Oh, Hannah, Hannah, do you want to do that one? Well, normally you would put it under the tiller. It just keeps it quite accessible. Um, it tucks away there. I don't know where Rod's, I mean, I presume that's where Rod's planning on putting it. We would normally tuck it under the tiller there. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, the back part of the boat, uh, right near the transom, um, you set it up with brackets off to the side, depending if it's double-handed boat, then obviously it's a smaller, smaller raft if you're fully crewed. Um, yeah, then it then it uh, yeah may require uh, may require being up on its end in the corner of the transom. But that earlier shot you showed, Louis, shows quite a bit of area back there, and um, it's pretty easy to divert. Right now, it looks a little deceiving because the uh, the backstay is holding the backstay uh, tails are kind of holding the tiller center line, which mm -hmm. is what I would call a poor man's autopilot. In fact, that's what I used two <laughs> days ago to deliver Rod's boat. Um, was uh, the autopilot wasn't hooked up yet, so so loop the uh, backstay tails on the tiller, just kind of tighten them up, and uh, could leave the boat uh, going for about a minute or so while I uh, I worked on other stuff. Okay, Alistair, I hope that's uh, answered your question. Um, we'll go back to this uh, great slide of uh, Rod. He he really does look like a kid in a sweet shop. I've got to say, with his uh, <laughs> with his with his new boat. Um, and uh, thanks very much for telling us his plans. Obviously, uh, all things are up in the air at the moment, but uh, we'll see that. Um, this is a nice aerial shot showing the layout of the boat and some of the some of the gear on board. Um, Jeff, I, I wanted you to say what comes as standard with this boat, with the J ninety nine, and why do you make that? Why do you make those standards so high? I'm going to say that. Well, I mean, starting right off the bat, the uh uh, if 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 the idea is to have people be able to sail in these offshore events, then the standard level of equipment's got to be set up for it. And um, and really, all uh, all you have to add to the boat is I mean, you add sails, electronics, and and uh, you know loose safety gear, and however you're going to finish the bottom. But but otherwise, the uh, the hardware and the running rigging, um, you know, you're pretty well all set to go. Um, the most distinguishing feature is probably the fixed sprit, which you can see just part of it mm -hmm. uh, up forward. And uh, that was a conscientious decision uh, made with um, designer Al Johnstone and then uh, Didier Lemoyle of J Composites um, uh, developing this project is uh, trying to identify um, some of the uh, items for offshore sailing that might um, uh, might make it easier to sail. And in fact, actually, you wouldn't think that pulling a sprit out and retrieving a sprit is is much work, uh, but it is one more step in the process. And uh, with a fixed sprit, you're able to uh, reduce weight in the bow. Uh, you're able to make it more watertight. And, um, and plus, you finish sooner. You finish uh, four feet uh, quicker. Um, of course, you have to remember you start four feet quicker too, so watch out for the sprit <laughs> on the starting line. Um, yeah, yeah. The other, uh, yeah, I think the other really interesting thing um, is uh, what we found uh, taking a close look at uh, the rigs. There are two ways to go with uh, with rigs, uh, aluminum or carbon. But but uh, beyond that, um, we we've, we felt there were two optimum ways to go. Either you have an aluminum rig that's absolutely custom fitted to the boat i.e. a new extrusion, in essence, like a custom aluminum rig, um, uh, or you go with a high modulus 
uh, really advanced uh, technology carbon rig at a huge price. Um, anywhere in between, and you're and you're compromising. Um, and uh, we felt um, actually, I don't know if you uh, if this is the, if you want me to show you a cross section of the spar, but um, we felt that um, with the with the aluminum uh, rig that uh, was custom design section. I'm going to just hold this up in front of me. Yeah. You can see a, a track on the back of the mass. That's actually part of the extrusion, extruded aluminum. So you're able to, uh, and this this whole section was custom designed and engineered by AG Plus in France specifically for the boat. So we weren't settling on a uh, off the shelf component. The tube weight of that aluminum rig is equivalent to the tube weight of a mass-produced carbon production rig. And yet, um, under measured handicap, the uh, carbon spars get, get hammered uh, under, uh, under a lot of the rules. So uh, we felt that uh, for both this size, that the best performance value would be to have a really high-quality aluminum rig um, where you could really easily set the, set the sails to the rig and have adjustability. And, uh, and it's... Uh, and it keeps uh, the fleet consistent. So we're, we're excited about that. And um, uh, beyond that, the Sprit and the uh, rig, uh, the low VCG keel that I mentioned earlier is, mm-hmm. a, is a huge, huge feature. And the one more thing about the rig is that it's got, uh, it's offshore set up. You've got a, a main halyard and you have a provision if you wanted to rig it two to one. You've got uh, two kite halyards, two jib halyards, and then a staysail halyard. Uh, all the exits in the mast uh, and all the provisions on the deck to uh, run extra lines aft. Great. Yeah, that, thank you very much. Okay. Concise, um, um, but beautifully put, Jeff. Um, just to remind the people watching, if you, if you want to ask some questions, you can put a question in the comment box. You can also send us a question later on and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, give you an email address to do that too. Um, now, Here's a shot of uh, J Composites construction. I think Jeff pointed out this is uh, actually not a J99 in the, the middle picture. It's a slightly larger boat, but it's built the same way. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring in Hannah first and say, you know, I know J Boats and J Composites have had a, a really long established business Um but J Composites is very close to key yachting in Hamble as well, isn't it, Hannah? It is. I mean, the the whole J Boats family is is very integral. Um, works very closely with all its dealers, um, and we've known Jeff and and Didier Lemoyle and and his J Composites team for a very long time. And I think you know, as as Jeff mentioned, Paul was a huge part of the you know the early stages of the design of the ninety nine. Um, and, and we were working close consultation to to be able to bring a, a product to market that that meets a demand that you know I think only as you're you're stood you know on you know on a boat with somebody you start seeing what might be the next next idea next plan so it's it's always been a very good relationship that we've we've you know had with with the whole team mm-hmm. and and Jeff you know um, fifteen thousand boats I think Joe boats but I think they know. When they've got a, a good builder or a good relationship with a builder when they see one. Just explain the relationship between J Boats and J Composites in Les Albert de Long. Well, it's it's much more than a building relationship, Louis. It's um, it started back in uh, 1994, actually. Uh, I met Didier and uh, La Rochelle when we were supplying, uh, I think it was uh, 20 J24s and 12 uh J twenty two is huge effort from uh, from J Boats Italy and and um, and uh, the classes and that's where I first met Didier and that's where we first um, first had uh, you know, got started with uh, boat building within um, a year of that and uh, so it's been over twenty five years mm-hmm. and um, so uh, when you've worked together that long you you develop a, uh, a momentum and um, and it's uh, really it was starting with the J one hundred nine and 2001 was the first full collaborative pro, um, process where Al Johnstone, uh, my brother, and the, our head designer um, and Didier worked together to collaborate on the development of the 109. Um, so we provided the design, and 
Didier uh, managed the uh, development of uh, the tooling and the and the uh, and the uh, taking taking the boat right up to production and and we're all together for the launch uh, uh, that year and since then it's been a number of collaborations very successful and uh, 99 was the same way it was uh, it was really a co-development between uh, J Composites and J Boats. And if you could just explain uh, some of the uh, imagery in this picture uh, of, of the construction of, of the J-Boats uh, in, uh, at J-Composites. Yeah, one of the, uh, uh, one of the huge uh, benefits and, uh, you know, the, and, and advantages I think we have with the long relationship is uh, the facility, the J-Composites facility and the workforce uh, was the first in Europe to be trained and and be licensed back in the mid 90s for the scrimp molding system which is uh, a uh, an open open mold uh, vac a high vacuum bag uh, infusion system that um, reduces emissions um, allows a, a, a very clean uh, clean mold room um, you see people in lab coats and yeah. hand laying in uh, uh, dry dry material and um, it's not just a uh, process that you can pick up at the turn of a hat. It's it's you have to change your whole facility and train your workforce to uh, to build uh, with this system. And um, and they've been doing it now for for uh, close to 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the major parts, the uh, the hull, deck, uh, primary bulkheads uh, for most of the boats are uh, are done uh, under vacuum. Uh, it's a highly controlled uh, process. Uh, there's only a certain amount of resin that can go into the laminate, and um, and uh, what comes out you see in the bottom right-hand picture a hull being uh, popping out of the mold, mm -hmm. and really the only uh, dirty work, so to speak, to do, uh, which you end up having to do in a um, in a booth with separate ventilation, is to uh, do a little after molding patchwork on some of the seams where you do a little gel coat repair, and then. You end up with a part like the deck on the on the top left, where um, it's uh, ready for the drilling jigs, mm -hmm. and basically a finished uh, deck with all the moldings uh, molded in, and um, and that'll get fitted with hardware while the interior goes in the boat, and then usually a week or two before the boat's finished, uh, you know, you'll deck it. Yeah, I, I, and 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 when you're getting that sort of precision. I, I, I'm, get, I'm saying very little secondary bonding between the hull and the deck, and look at the detail on the on on the deck that's that's coming out. Uh, it, it it it's consistent and pre and there's a lot of precision involved. Jeff, is that a fair one? Well, everything. Um, I mean, it, in production, uh, you know, to to reach a, a competitive price in the market, you need to. Um, you need to have control on your labor costs, and the and the best way to do that is make a big investment up front on patterns and jigs. And so usually that's why it takes for a first boat it takes usually four or five times the amount of time as a as hull number ten, because uh, you mold the hull and then you make uh, aluminum or other uh, style jigs so that the bulkheads are all precisely located. Uh, every um, Every piece of uh, wood in the interior gets patterned, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so so the idea is at the end once you've built uh, ten to twelve boats that you hopefully achieve your target uh, number of hours to uh, to complete the boat. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I think the people at home might want a bit of sailing action. Um, <laughs> we've uh, we've got we've gone quite technical there. So uh, here's uh, another. Thank you, Stu Johnson, for this um, video. I believe it was a very big team that shot this. I think it was uh, his wife driving the rib. I think Stu was on the... Ca anyway, I'll stop talking and play the video. Just a short video. And there's, no, um, there's no commentary, guys, so feel free to uh, talk over this one. Yeah, so that's... Is, yeah, go ahead. Carry. I was just going to say that actually this this race was our first race with all the team that we had on board sailing together. There were six of us, and it was all, you know, it was great fun to be to be sailing the boat, basically fresh out of the can to to you know give it a go. Yeah, yeah, and and compared to the last video that we showed, 
where you were VMG effectively. This looks like you're much more on, on a power power reach, uh, Jeff. Would that be fair? Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. We had uh, it was a staggered start. So the smaller boats start first, and the uh, maxis start at the end. And uh, we all meet up at the north end and yell buoy room at each other. But the uh, uh, in the process, we were the only boats in front of us at this point were a bunch of old classics. And we could see about um, half a mile or a mile ahead that the wind was uh, was heading us and picking up a lot. Uh -huh. And so at this point, we started to uh, heat it up a lot because we knew we were going to get a header. And that was, um, in the end, that turned out uh, to be the right move. Okay. The, the, shot that, the shot that you opened the show with of us with the bow out of the water and boat planing right at the photo boat. We nearly ran down a photo <laughs> boat um, right as we got a third, right as we got, a, I think it was a 25 plus knot gust. Okay. A Swan 48 uh, rounded up behind us with a code zero. Um, and uh, we were holding off a J121 at the time. And, uh, and we had worked our way up enough. So when we got that 30 knot gust, we could just bear off and just go planing right to the bridge. And so we, we held off all the big boats for a good couple miles there before uh, the breeze uh, abated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and tell me, you've got you've got a headsail ready to go there. It looks like it's hang Tom. Is that is that is that correct? Uh, that's right. Yeah, we we uh, we gave that a try uh, this last summer. Um, we uh, yeah we felt that uh, it's a small enough boat that um, you know especially for for uh, short handed that. Uh, being able to uh, have a hanked on jib. And uh, so if you're offshore and it's all of a sudden blowing hard, you had to get the jib down. Mm -hmm. uh, much easier to uh, control it on the foredeck. If you can just drop the halyard, throw a sail tie around it, yeah, yeah. maybe unclip a, a couple of bottom hanks and rehank on a, uh, a new jib. But, but to have uh, vertical battens or have it kind of coming out of a foil. Um, I mean, for inshore racing like this, uh, um, yeah, I'd, I'd use roller furling or um, mm -hmm. myself, but um, for offshore shorthanded, actually, Hanks is a great program. Okay. Well, I better let everyone get their fix. We all want to go sailing. You see the, actually, you can just see the bridge just starting to come up and uh, okay. uh, we, har we hardly have uh, anyone around us. That was a great moment. Yeah, I bet it. I bet it was. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so we've seen the we've seen the J ninety nine uh, planing. We've seen the we've seen it reaching, um, and it, it is a great reaching machine. Here's a great shot of uh, Paul Hayes um, on the J ninety nine back home, but in the UK that is. But this is an all rounder. It's not just a downwind speed machine. What is the balance? And I'm going to move to the next slide. What is the balance? How do you achieve it to give it the upwind performance? Yeah, I, I, I can start on that, Hannah, if you want to um, um, then add something. But, um, you know, for us, sailing upwind is just, that's part of the thrill of sailing. That's um, for, I think, I think most sailors uh, sailing a boat a well-balanced boat upwind, um, especially if it's blowing hard and you got you know reef main and a small jib and the boat's just trucking upwind. There's something very satisfying about that, and mm. and I think real I think realistically, um, you know, it's the opposite of the law of gravity. Gravity, what comes up goes down, and sailboat and and in sailing, uh, whatever goes downwind eventually has to come back upwind, unless you. Uh, go downwind to Hawaii and, and put it on a freighter to come back to California. <laughs> um, the, um, but uh, and when you think of most racing, uh, if, if you're starting and finishing in one location, starting and finishing in Newport, for instance, or like that around the island race, um, we all remember the downwind, uh, but it goes by so fast. In, in, in actuality, you spend two to three times the amount of time going upwind and uh, so for us, uh, that um, upwind performance and is absolutely critical. So it starts with stability. You have to have stability. Um, I think from a hull shape standpoint, if you orient the hull strictly for downwind reaching with really a beamy after sections, then uh, when you turn, um, 
turn the corner and go upwind, um, you have a boat that tends to want to bury its bow, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and it's unbalanced. And I think uh, you know this is one of the reasons. Uh, yeah, we spend so much time, uh, Brother Al and my dad, uh, Rod, spend so much time on the hull design. Uh, and we usually, we only come out with one new boat a year, typically. And so they're spending a lot of time refining the design of the hull to make sure it balances well on all points of sale. The, the one last thing I'll point out is we've just, we've just shown you, uh, these pictures are all from fairly breezy days, but um, another huge issue is sailing upwind in light air. And um, what uh, we always strive for is to minimize the wetted surface of the hull so that with these non-overlapping sail plans, you uh, still have a boat that's going to be slippery in light air. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's definitely true here for, for solar waters, particularly when we have the light air days. What we all know is that we have a huge amount of tide going through the solar. So mm-hmm. when you, you know, in a cow's week race and you've been sent down to Limington and beyond, which we all have from time to time, you want to know that you're going to be able to, to turn around and come back, even, you know, in light airs or, or heavy. And, and that's the luxury of, of the 99, which is, you know, what is core in the DNA of, of the boat um, and what all the time and energy is spent you know, doing with the designers at the early stages to give us this all round sailing boat. Because, you know, as Jeff says, we all, we all got to go with whilst going downwind is really great fun. We all know that it's got to turn the corner at some point and come home. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and that, that's a very good comment, Hannah, particularly with the tides that we can get in the Solent to be able to go upwind and beat the tide. Uh, that can be a, a winning strategy if the boat has the upwind performance and still has the ability to play downwind. Yeah, um, I'm going to pop to the next slide uh, which has been purposefully chosen because there's two people on board and two-handed racing has been massively on the up for uh, well over a decade and will be an Olympic class for we lost you Louis yeah Louis we lost your sound there So I'll, I'll jump in. I think yeah. like I think Louis was uh, going to mention uh, the Olympic uh, discipline and and um, some of the other things. The I, yeah, the double handed uh, double handed offshore sailing has always had a really strong uh, niche market, and um, but it's for for a lot of sailors it hasn't really been accepted because you you have to be highly trained because um, uh, you're going offshore for days at a time. And uh, I think what's uh, what Part of what's inspired us with the, both the 121 and the 99 is the popularity of the double-handed day racing that's going on and a lot of those events that are very popular um, because that's achievable. That's adventure that you can do within daylight hours and not have to file your, your float plan with the Coast Guard and, um, and go through all sorts of offshore training. And uh, now with the Olympics, uh, adding a mixed-gender uh, offshore keelboat discipline. Um, I think that's fantastic for sailing. I think that uh, highlights one of the most um, appealing uh, attributes of the sport and recreation it is that sense of adventure um, uh, that sailing brings. And uh, so we're really excited about that. Obviously, the 99 is well suited for that kind of event. Um, uh, but the event will be provided boats and they'll, they'll pick that a year before the event. And so hopefully that'll help uh, bring a whole new generation of uh, double handers um, out sailing. Yeah, and I think um, extending on that, Jeff, it's you know the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. The it's going to become more and more important to be able to be you know on your boat and and not around a lot of people at the moment. So you know if the boat's set up for sing, uh, for single double handed or you know family cruising, then it's then it's great too. Louis, you back with us? I think I think so. Can't can't hear you, Louis. Okay, uh, let's try this. Let's try. How about that? Can you hear me now? Yes. There you go. There we <laughs> are. <laughs> Slight technical problems. I'll ha- I'll have to sack my sound engineer. I tell you, but uh, I was listening. 
very attentively to that. And <laughs> and I I'm I sure. think it's it's quite a you know it, obviously it's affecting us all right now. And you know one of the phrases coming out is the new normal. And Jeff, you you mentioned that when we had a chat earlier on about you know what is going to be the new normal and why do you think it, that the J ninety nine might just fit the bill. Well, I think we're we're. We were talking about what what sailing's going to look like, or as we start to do more sailing, um, you know what uh, what's going to be possible. And and uh, uh, there's an event. Um, um, yeah, Adam Lurie from UK Sailmakers is pulling together. A, I think it's a double-handed or family uh, a quarantining event where uh, uh, a dozen boats will meet out at a buoy in a couple of weeks, and there's no race committee, no entry fee. Um, you can only bring people on board that you're already quarantining with, and it'll just be a staggered start pursuit race, and uh, everyone will wave to each other on their way back to their uh, their mooring. And um, you know, it may be something like that initially. It's going to be very local, local based, um, safe sailing, if you will, and mm-hmm. and maybe uh, uh, from there it'll be. Uh, it could very well be you you provision your boat for the long weekend. You bring your family on board and you sail slash deliver your boat to where you're going. You, um, you hang out, whether it's for a cruise or a sail or maybe a fun race. Mm-hmm. Uh, you live on board, you cook on board, you go home, but you, uh, you enjoy sailing and enjoy it, enjoy it together. And it, it's, it may be something like that. And in, in which case all of those thousands and thousands of, of cruiser racers, um, or just cruisers, or just racers with a few bunks, uh, may uh, truly become dual purpose again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, uh, n- nobody's got all the answers to what's you know going on at the moment, but uh, that makes an awful lot of sense to me. I have to say, uh, you know, for a family or a bunch of students that are all living together, uh, that might well comply with uh, what's going on now. Um, we have Robin Young watching, and he must be he must be psychic because uh, Robin's just asked this question. Great. Well, we we talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, you know, for offshore sailing or offshore shorthanded, um, the fixed bow spread gives you uh, a little a little easier to. Uh, uh, for managing, you're not having to pull it in and out. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's more, it's more watertight. Um, not having to seal off any bearings, uh, a little less weight. And, uh, with a fixed bob stay, it's uh, better set up, uh, for the code zero type sales. And, um, yeah, the limiting factor is you can't make it necessarily as long as you would might want to, if it was, uh, if you're trying to, um, you know, pack on a bigger spinnaker. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you could, but it's just, it's not very practical to have a long bowsprit um, and swiping it off on dock pilings. But this particular case, you see actually two different bowsprits. And this was at the J Cup, uh, 299 sailing against each other as Didier and Fred Bouvier on the other boat. And um, they had uh, set up their boat uh, specifically for IRC round the buoys, windward lure type sailing. In which case, uh, there's a rating advantage to uh, to going with a, a symmetric kite and then uh, being able to deploy a uh, a code sail off the shorter sprit. Uh, so they uh, it was actually an interesting side by side test. Uh, they would be, they could beat us on rating. We were pretty match pretty well matched uh, when we're lured, although downwind they could go lower. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, they generally beat us in the close course races. And then when we had the distance race where we stretched out, uh, we beat them. So um, really all depends. Uh, the, the, the base boat is really consistent across the board, um, but you are able to um, you know, cater the boat, you know, work with your dealer on the prevailing conditions and the handicap rule that you have in the area and, and optimize the boat um, primarily with the sail configuration to mm-hmm. uh, take advantage of the rating. Mm-hmm. And, and Hannah, uh, over to you, you know, having this flexibility in terms of uh, having a, a bowsprit or a stub bowsprit, or in this case, pole, you can adapt 
the boat that you have, the J99 that you have, to the type of sailing and the conditions that you are in. Is that a fair one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not one, one boat doesn't suit all, but if you can have some small factors that you can adapt and change to suit an individual's sailing environment, then it's it, it makes it a much more flexible boat for, for people to consider. Um, as you can see, we've got the, the asymmetric and the symmetric set up um, available on this model. Um, Jeff touched briefly on the, on the options on, on the keels. Um, we wanted to give flexibility to the model and that was key, but we also didn't want it to be too far away from, you know, kind of a, one design of a boat. So if there is a kit situation where a few different 99s that are slightly tweaked differently to suit the owner's, mm -hmm. owner's plans is they could actually come back together and do some one design racing. I mean, that is a big fundamental of the, the, the J-Boats way. I mean, we have the biggest one designs in the world and, you know, we don't want to detract too much from that, but we also appreciate people have different plans and different, you know, ambitions to combine in their sailing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, Arnold as well, um, he's asked a, a different question, but it's sort of much the same. You, you've got the ability to adapt the boat to suit a, a rating, whether you're racing IRC, ORC, inshore, offshore, etc., etc. And uh, I hope that answers your question as well, Arnold. Um, I think we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. And I was quite amazed i'll be honest with you when i saw the interior on the j99 uh, i had no idea it had a, a full interior um i know um hannah there's a couple of things that you particularly like about the interior uh please go ahead well we've got two full aft cabins so you've got plenty of space for 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 being on board with with the family or or for the crew or for storage we all know that we've always got way too many uh fenders and bits and pieces that we need to, to stir away, but also the forward facing chart table, quite a few uh, boats you don't get to, to see this so much, you know, the, the reliance on the iPad is great, but actually sitting down when you're, you're double handing offshore or, or going offshore with a full crew, it's nice to have the flexibility. Um, I also think carrying on from what, what Jeff said is that going into this different you know, new, new, new that we're yeah. all going into, being able to use the boat um, with the whole crew staying on board. You've got the options for, for pipe cots to have in the in the saloon. So you can actually almost sleep an entire crew, well, you can sleep an entire crew on the uh, on board when you get to, to the port, you know, the likes of shorthanded job racing here in the UK. There's so much flexibility by having this interior um, that, you you really have got all the options covered here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and Jeff, you know, a lot of people talk about racer cruisers, um, but I have to say, looking at this, looking at the boat, you know, this is a true racer cruiser. Um, uh, that that's part of the concept. Is that is that fair? Well, I think it it it, it makes the the ninety nine makes the most of the interior, um, and and certainly the. Uh, yeah, the headroom was a huge factor, and that was something. Uh, yeah, we've been we've been doing this for forty. Gosh, I don't know how forty two years or so, and and uh, and a lot of designs, but we've never had a boat, never had a planing capable thirty two and a half footer that also had um, you know a, a reasonable cruising accommodation. And I wouldn't uh, call it a cruising boat compared to something like a ninety seven E um, that has a, a lot more volume, but. Uh, but it is uh, a lot more comfortable than you expect. And one of the, I'll, I'll just point out one of the compromises that, that uh, Al and Didier um, uh, came up with in the process was not trying to stick a V-berth into it. And um, uh, so basically it's uh, the V-berth area is kind of a foreshortened area really for sail storage and for the head. And by pushing that main bulkhead forward really enabled it, um, uh, the layout you see to, mm -hmm. to happen, which is full length settees in the middle. You can have fold up pilots as an option. So you could actually sleep two on the high side in the main cabin. Um, you see the line storage bags there. And then actually a proper offshore galley and nav station and two F cabins. And uh, I'll just give you an example. Rod, I mentioned Rod and Clay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're going to do the, um, so they, they got that boat to do the double handed Bermuda race, which which is not uh, happening this year. 
Um, but uh, uh, the other part of that plan was uh, Rod and Lucia, my parents, planning to cruise the boat for a good part of the summer. Um, and then uh, when the boat's in Stonington Harbor, it's going to be three generations of family, um, probably someone different every Wednesday night, which is the normal for our family. Um, uh, hopping on the boat could be five or six people to do some beer can sailing or racing. All right, come on, Jeff. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this: Who is the most musically talented of the Johnston family? Oh my gosh, uh, that, I, you cannot put me on the spot for that. <laughs> uh, I reckon it's Stu. I just I don't know. I don't know why I'm saying that, but he looks to me like you know he could definitely wail down a microphone. Uh, I, I, he might be able to. I'm not sure. I would say for me, the, the inspiration, uh, I mean, my parents, uh, we grew up uh, with music and uh, you know, dad plays banjo and uh, yeah. and uh, uh, my mom was a church organist. And so we all grew yeah. up playing instruments and uh, and it's like sailing. It's a lifelong, um, wonderful activity you can share with people of all ages. Okay. Well, we want the Johnston, the Johnston concert. I'm, I'm, I'm calling it now. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, you can see some funny sort of circles on these pictures of the uh, interior on the J99. That is because these uh, pictures are taken from a really cool 360 degree tour that you can take of the boat. And that's at jboats.com. Just go to the J99 page and there's a really cool way you can look inside the boat from the comfort of your own home. Um, okay. Um now we've got a, a sort of a bit of a a, a, a general slide here, and uh, of the boat beautifully set up, I have to say. Um, and the idea here was, um, you know, just to sort of uh, answer a couple of questions. But there are dozens of questions we're not <laughs> going to be able to answer them all. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, going to ask uh, Jeff and Hannah. We're going to we're going to play. Um, another um video which uh, is going to take us up to a full hour that we've been online and this is a video taken by david pritchard thank you very much and really we chose it yes there's a paul hayes who is a big part of this uh, uh, of this boat but it's also uh, shows two people on board different cell combinations there is no sound whatsoever so jeff and hannah please uh, feel free to make some comments and uh, we'll come back to everybody watching about getting your questions answered because uh, um, we definitely will do. We just have not got time to answer uh, all the dozens of questions right now. But uh, check out this video. This is yeah, just this is back in December, wasn't it, uh, Hannah? Yeah. It was, and uh, the boat had just made its world premiere at the Paris Boat Show. Um, and it went directly from Paris to Hamble, uh, where it had its kill fitted. And oh, actually, no, I think it stopped at the yard, had its kill fitted, then came over to us. Um, and I think this was a, really was literally just before Christmas. And the yard came over, and we uh, we got the boat all rigged up, uh, electronics fitted, um, and and splashed in on the water. I think anybody who who knew Paul Hayes would know that. Uh, he would not be the one to have a boat sat on the hard over Christmas. There would be buyers wanting to come and sail and see what the boat can do. So, you know, in, in proper Mr. Hayes style, the boat went out and we started taking some videos and, and seeing what this brand new model from Jay could do. Um, yeah, and as you can see, it was glamorous conditions, flat water. Don't see that often around here. Uh, blue skies. And yeah, we just started started really stretching our legs the yard came over and they they did some test setting with us too and uh, jeff just one one for you here um how many are we up to how many j99s have uh, have been commissioned uh number 47 made it to uh made it through the swiss alps a couple of weeks ago by truck um and uh right now uh and in a, a couple of weeks time um uh be close to hell number 50, certainly by the end of May. Um, I, I've noticed a few of the questions. All of the, the um, all of the boats are uh, built in in Les Sables de France by J Composites, and um, 
Right now, out of the 47 that have been shipped, uh, they've gone to 16 different countries on four oh. continents. So a huge, um, you know, a, a, a huge worldwide distribution. Um, and, and they've gone to everyone from serious double handers to uh, people who are just looking for a, a great all around sailboat and, uh, and to a few people who are uh, downsizing from bigger boats and just want a great solo day sailor. Wow. And, um, and Hannah, um, I did notice one comment there. Um, let's, let's just pop this up um, from Mary Shores there. All the boats made in France for the, for the US too. And I'll, I'll add to that. And when's the, next, uh, when's the next one available? When's the next build slot, Hannah? Yeah, so we are looking at build slots now for September. The yard has started slowly making plans on, on increasing production um, once all these uh, uh, restrictions are lifted. Uh, number 50, as Jeff said, will be coming out of the moulds and coming out of the yard uh, really, really soon. Um, it takes about, from, from point of moulding to, to pushing out the door, is about eight weeks. Um, and we have actually got number 52 come, going to be coming to her new home here in the Solent um, and we're expecting her around June, June time. So there is still, you know, plenty of planning to do to get your orders in for, for autumn delivery and be completely on the water by by later on this year. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah Louis, I would yeah. I would add that the uh, that uh, the 99, like uh, like virtually all of our boats, um, uh, uh, is built to custom order. Uh, in other words, it's to the cu customer specification. Mm -hmm. And uh, so most of the 47 boats shipped out or have gone to owners. There are uh, probably three or four uh, that have gone to dealers who um, are dealers or, or sailors like ourselves mm -hmm. and experts. And, uh, and a lot of times we come out with a brand new boat and and everyone can't help themselves but order one for themselves. Uh, so we have probably three or four out in the network that um, you know, were planned on doing events this season. We don't know how that's going to shape up. But uh, so if someone had to get one right away, uh, we can probably find one for somebody. OK, cool. Um, thank you for that question, Mary. Um, we'll just play out the rest of the video and... Uh, So if you want to uh, ask any more questions, particularly from Hannah at Key Yachting in Hamble, that's the best address to contact, info at keyyachting.com. And if you've got any questions for Jeff, you can use the same email address and we'll very happily send them on as well. Lots of questions to, uh, to answer there, guys. But... That's all we've got time for. Uh, we've, uh, we've done a full hour presentation. Uh, thank you to Hannah and Jeff for a really interesting talk, very educational on the J99. And thank you for watching the show. And if you've missed some of the show or you'd like to watch it again, a replay will be posted here and on YouTube after the presentation. It might take a little bit longer to... Uh, to get up on uh, YouTube. But uh, thank you for your questions. We'll try and answer them all. Uh, I've got to say last words to Hannah, Hannah first. Hannah. Thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to being back on the water soon. But in the meantime, any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. And, and Jeff. Well, take care, everyone. Uh, safe sailing. Hope, hope uh, everyone's able to get out and uh, enjoy. Uh, what hopefully will be some nice weather shortly. Uh, thank you, Louis and, and Hannah. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Nice way yeah, to spend a Thursday Jeff. morning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Louis. Okay. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, we hope that you all stay safe and get sailing soon.